You are listening to the Cycling Podcast at Our Giro d'Italia. Brought to you by I Woke Up, flexible loans built for small businesses. Today, we are in Bergamo. Cozze cittele, cozze, cozze piscine. Non spigude cicora, non spigude cicora. Cozze cittele, cozze, cozze piscine. Non spigude cicora, se non mangiano le femmine. Where are we, Lionel? We're in Bergamo, Richard, a beautiful town in the heart of Lombardy. It is beautiful. I was there quite recently for uh, Il Lombardia, which started there last year. Um, and it's, well, it's been in the news for much sadder reasons over recent months, hasn't it? But a regular stop on the on the Giro. We've been there many times over the years, haven't we, uh, Daniel? Yes, we have. And it's a symbolic city for Italian cycling. As mentioned uh, recently in a recent podcast when we spoke to Marco Pinotti and uh, Monica, or sorry, Paola Santini of the, um, the clothing manufacturer Santini, there's a really strong tradition culture of cycling in Bergamo. It really was the, the centre of the cycling universe up until not very long ago and um, has been terribly affected by the coronavirus crisis. It's m- made the headline around the world hasn't it and you know small villages um, close to Bergamo that previously well whose only claim to fame was really cycling a place like Nembro um, which we're going to talk about was sort of base camp for the famous Selvino climb it's on our route today but um, we've seen Nembro which is a tiny village being mentioned in on TV news in the UK I'm sure in other countries as well Another place nearby is Cheney, of course, home to the uh, Scuola Ciclismo Cheney, which we are raising money for through the sale of Stacey Snyder's cycling podcast Giro mugs and cappuccino sets. And if you're listening to this episode in very timely fashion, well, um, act quickly, because at 12.30 p.m. U.S. East Coast time, that's 5.30 p.m. British summer time or 6.30 p.m. Central European time, the second and final batch of... Uh, mugs and cappuccino sets go on sale go to etsy.com forward slash shop forward slash snyder ceramics details in the episode notes uh, but the proceeds from the sales uh, all the all the profits from the sales of those uh, mugs and cups go to the um the cycling school in Cheney near to bergamo and it was uh, a good cause um suggested to us by Marco Pinotti. Um, Bergamo also the home of uh, Felice Gimondi, wasn't it, who who died last year, great Italian champion. We heard a bit about him from Sir Paul Smith in Sunday's episode. And our route, fashion. Rich, today we'll be going through Sedrina, which is the village that Felice Gimondi was from, where his, where his mother was the was a postwoman, um, and um, I think she was the first woman in the in the village who had a bike and she did her post rounds on the bike for years and years i think she lived to, to the age of about 108 in the end and i should say a word we mentioned fashion there daniel you're resplendent in your mape cap a clue perhaps as today's to the, the subject matter of today's episode lionel any reason for your cas uh, casket that you've got perched on your head there not a jira related one no um just just a cas cap just felt like it what's your cap have you ever, also cas? Have you ever had a i have a, yeah a cas? On a, a, there's a, a, i have yes a bitter cast have you had that i quite enjoy that the red sort of well you get a lot of similar drinks in um in italy quinotto is a famous one and um crodino they're like a non-alcoholic tonic type drink during childhood trips to France and Spain and staying on campsites, I mean, just seeing a, a, a sort of a, a, an advertising board outside a cafe on a campsite for advertising cas used to make my holiday. I'd rush in there with, with an old French franc coin and buy a can of cas, and that would be uh, that would be me happy L- as little Lionel, very happy, happy as Lionel with, I'd be with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what have we got coming up today, Daniel? Well, Rich, you alluded to the main feature of today's podcast, and we're going to be speaking to someone who made his name at the MAPE team, not me. We, we hear from me every day. Um, I, of course, famously had a brief spell at MAPE um, in a fairly, you know, a, a, a fairly down at heel capacity. Um, but we're going to be speaking to Luca Guercilena, who is the manager now of the Trek Segafredo team, and he 
cut his teeth at Mape um, way back at the start of the well, the start of the millennium. And um, Luca is from well, a place just to the uh, west of Milan, where we would be staying tonight after the stage of Bergamo because tomorrow's stage starts in Magenta and that's just down the road from where Luca was born and still lives. Whenever you and hear um, Guercialena, do, do either of you... I, I always think of the Macarena. Hey, Guercialena. No? <laughs> Not nope. really, no. Um, t- tough roads in Lombardy. Can you give us a tale of the tapa, please, Lionel? I can indeed, yeah. We're going from Morbenio to Bergamo, 172.9 kilometres. The first big climb is over the Paso San Marco, but the one that we'll be riding, Richard, is the Selvino, as Daniel mentioned, reaches 948 metres. Um, but it's famous for other reasons, isn't it, Daniel? Well, it's famous in Giro history for Andy Hampston winning a stage there in 1988. It's famous for Tony Rominger winning a time trial, a mountain time trial up, up the Selvino in 1995. And um, yeah, it's the it's the sort of Alpe d'Huez of the, the Bergamo region. A lot of hairpins. It's actually quite an, a nice, easy climb, Napalm. I think it could suit you. Um, but just... You mentioned the first climb of the day, the Paso San Marco, a fantastic, a, a huge climb, um, which is not that well known, almost 2,000 metres altitude. I would recommend it to anyone who cycles in that, um, in the Bergamo region. Um, another one I would recommend, which is just slightly east of there, is the Paso del Vivione, again, not very well known, and a real, well, the, the sort of dimensions of a, a real classic Giro or Tour de France type climb, um, very underrated. Yeah, it's beautiful looking, the Selvino, isn't it? The, particularly the aerial shots of the road kind of just draped across the hillside. Very nice indeed. Um, our route is 34.6 kilometres and it's basically the climb and the descent of the Selvino. Not sure um, that we'll notice the hairpins too much on the RGT cycling platform, but uh, here we go. Let's see how we're getting on on the climb. Well, I've crested the summit of the Selvino. Not sure, but nice and easy, Daniel didn't feel like that to my tired legs but anyway Bergamo is in my sights if anybody would like an easier ride 16 kilometers on Sunday for the final stage Lionel and I will be riding that at 10 a.m British summertime come and join us and wave as you ride past as I mentioned earlier the cappuccino cups and mugs made by Stacey Snyder go on sale today Um, they're raising money for the Squala Ciclismo Cheney and Daniel a day or so ago spoke to Eduardo Maffeis of the Squala Ciclismo Cheney to find out a bit more about the club and what they're planning to do with all the money that we're raising through the sales of mugs and cappuccino sets and of course the wine from Divine Cellars. Sì, allora Scuola Ciclismo Cene eh, ormai ha eh, 25 anni circa di, di attività ciclistica. The Scuola Ciclismo Cene has been going for 25 years now. We've had a few riders in our ranks who have gone on to turn pro. Andrea Di Corrado, who used to ride for Bardiani, was one, and Alessandro Bazzana, who was at United Healthcare for years, was another. This year we have 10 under 16s and 7 juniors or under 18s. We started the season with a nice training camp down in Sicily because we've got an affiliation with the team down there, but then, well, we all know what happened. Last Sunday was our first group ride with the boys again, all split into groups of three with one adult also riding in each group and the groups one or two minutes apart so there'd be no dangerous gathering or standing around together. No doubt come the end of the season some of our sponsors will be looking at their investment and thinking they can't renew given what they've all been through over the last few months. We're quite lucky though in the sense that we've got lots of little sponsors rather than two or three big ones and maybe that will make it easier to weather the storm. I should also add that the Italian Federation is trying to help out a bit. It seems as though they're going to waive the registration fees for teams in 2021, which helps to save a little bit. With the money raised by the Cycling Podcast listeners, we'd like to organise a couple of events, probably before the end of 2020. It looks as though normal road races will be hard to put on, so we're thinking of maybe a small circuit race, kind of kermess around the village of Cene. We can see the shoots of recovery in the region now. The numbers of contagions and deaths have gone down a lot, but you still sense the fear everywhere, which is hardly surprising given how hard we were hit. People are scared of a second wave. But yes, based on all of the numbers, we seem to be back on the right road again. 
you are listening to the Cycling Podcast at Our Giro d'Italia, brought to you by iWOCAP, flexible loans built for small businesses. iwoca.co.uk My name is Karen G and I am the Go Ride Coordinator for the junior part of Kendall Cycle Club. So we've got a group called Bike Buddies, which is for the very young children and they can start as soon as they're able to either ride a balance bike um, or a pedal bike and then when they get to an age where they've started school and they've been at school for a couple of terms they can move up into the more formal coaching um, go ride and then we take them all the way through um, till in, into their teenage years really. Thank you very much indeed to our headline sponsor, Iwaka, and uh, as well as supporting us, the Cycling Podcast, they support the Kendall Cycle Club up there in the Lake District. They're very into their cycling, Iwaka. Uh, a few days ago, we actually heard from, uh, well, testimony from an Iwaka customer, Mike Mooney, um, who runs Hub Velo in East London. And uh, Teo Gagan Hart, the team Ineos rider, got in touch to say that he's a very good friend of Mike Mooney's, and in fact, Mike's business partner at the shop was Teo's teacher at primary school. A small world, and uh, good to know that Teo's listening to our Giro coverage. That's that's nice. Um, hope you're enjoying it, Teo. Didn't actually say whether he was enjoying it or not, just that he was listening. We take, anyway. that, we take that as a given, surely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, when we were in Bergamo, Daniel, in 2017, four things uh, stick in my mind. One was a stage win for Bob Jungles. Two was seeing... I'm surprised that all four weren't food line. <laughs> this is astonishing. <laughs> hang on, hang on. We're building up to the important I'm bit. Surpri- I'm surprised he's addressing this to me because I'm boycotting his coming <laughs> sections from now on. I'm dragging you back in. I'm, the, I'm, uh, I'm bringing you back in, Daniel. Incident, the Prince of Savoy... Um, we, we, we promised that this Argero, these Argero podcasts were going to be a love letter to Italy. It's more like hate mail <laughs> to hundreds of years of culinary tradition. <laughs> Trashed anyway, by the, the elephant of Watford. Sp- ruined by trampled one, over. Ruined by one teaspoon of, a, of garlic sauce with a, with a lamb kebab last week. Dear me. I mean, I'm ne- am I ever going to live this down or are you going to keep mentioning I'm not it? Sure. No. Anyway, so the four <laughs> things I remember from Bergamo were uh, Bob Jungle's winning the stage, Moreno Argentine's time trial bike with a very curvy top tube was in a furniture shop window um we saw felice gimondi in the press room looking extremely dapper and all afternoon daniel you ran the advert that we were going to eat polenta in bergamo i think or we were going to be heading to wherever we were staying in the lombardy plains well what went wrong was we i didn't go wrong did it but we got invited to have a pizza with some colleagues um and uh we went for a, a fairly average pizza instead and i i missed out on polenta because i went home the following day so for this um, installment of Il Ristorante I uh, ordered some polenta I ordered some Tuscan sausages to go with it I mean I'm mixing my regions a bit here but I made an, a nice sausage ragu and reminds me of a famous Tour de France story Lionel what, what's, a, what's a Tuscan sausage <laughs> sausages from Tuscany oh will it, will do it, have we time to tell that now I can't I, I remember I think we we've were, told that it's been told already it has been told we, yeah we'll, it will come up again no doubt anyway um, Felicity Cloak award winning food writer and columnist for The Guardian has been running a forensic eye over my recipes so uh, let's hear what she made of my polenta e salsiccia il ristorante it always makes me laugh that polenta has this reputation in the uk as being sort of very um fancy you know chattering classes islington um food because actually it's it's basically like the Italian, Northern Italian equivalent of porridge. Um, here, it's based, you know, it's it's a staple crop that is cooked simply just with water. So, if you're going to be really fancy about it, you can, I see, milk put in it. Um, I've even seen it made with cream. But really, you just want um, polenta, one part polenta to about three parts water. You need to get that water boiling before you add the polenta, and then you sprinkle it on top while stirring vigorously. Um, and then you cook it really, really slowly because it turns very quickly um, from a pan of water with some dust in it to a bubbling, seething mass of lava that will spit <laughs> scalding corn all over your tender hands. Um, and ideally, you should cook it for up to an hour until it goes really thick and creamy. Um, Italians really frown upon quick cook polenta. 
I um, do not frown upon it, I have to say. Um, but I've had it um, uh, sort of, I've had it a lot in mountain regions of Italy, actually, um, with, with sausages. It goes really well with, um, you know, proper meaty Italian sausages. It's also lovely with loads of, <laughs> unsurprisingly, with loads of butter and cheese stirred into it. And then they, sometimes they then put it in the oven, really hot oven with like an, an egg cracked on top of it and some speck sort of cured cured ham um, and more cheese and it is just the nicest thing on a cold day um, yeah I'm a very big fan of polenta I'm very jealous that you're going to eat it because I've got none in my lockdown larder polenta is very typical of um, the north east of Italy in particular and you get it a lot um, up in the mountains as well and I thought that might have been a reference um, what you were referring to with your sort of jagged peaks of cheese that was sticking out of the polenta. It's quite a striking presentation. A um, little bit sort of dolomite with the cheese. Um, and um, it did look very nice. I couldn't I couldn't really tell what was going on with the sausage ragu because ragus have a tendency just to look like sauce. But um, I, don't, I think this was the one that I, I would have liked to have eaten most. It looked delicious. You had a good consistency. The, the polenta, I think, should spread like lava on the plate and it looked like yours had done that. Um, so, yeah, very impressive. I, I couldn't really find fault, annoyingly, with this one. Right, excellent. What's the secret to the polenta? And, or rather, what is what is it supposed to be like, the texture of it? Because it's kind of... Pe- people who criticise it as being bland and grainy, um, well, you can get over the blandness by just putting loads and loads of cheese mm-hmm. and butter in it, but the graininess is part, kind of part of its character. I mean, there's just it's, it's not supposed to be sort of whipped mashed potato smooth, is it? No, it should have a certain, um, yeah, coarseness to it. And that you can get very fine polenta, um, but I think that loses the charm. It becomes very pasty and sort of like gruel almost. I like a bit of a bit of texture to the polenta. Um, but the secret is supposed to be that you cook it for, you know, an hour on end. Um, it's very hot work. It's actually, when they're making large quantities, it's always seen as, the, you know, the strongest man in the household stirs the polenta. Um, and yeah, it's a real um, art and they take it very seriously. I do prefer to take a few shortcuts and just add enormous amounts of butter and cheese, uh, which gives the same creamy effect with slightly less in the way of um, muscular taxing. Um, but yeah, just ta- patience is uh, the secret, I would say. Excellent. Patience and fat. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> it's the key to most things. Well, my mouth's sort of watering, Lionel. Um, polenta, it does look very, your polenta looks very delicious. You always get a lot of polenta at the Giro, don't you, Daniel? Arguments between riders and little joke there. Polemica, polenta. polenta. Oh, um, God, terrible. Yeah, um, terrible. I, I, think pole- I think polenta. I think polenta's overrated. Oh, no. Discuss. No, I don't think you've ever had... Well, one, you don't really care about food. Daniel, I've eaten the best polenta in the best uh, polenta restaurant in Bergamo. I'll have you know. It's, it's, really? it's called yeah. Polenta, uh, Bergamo. Polenta R Us. Polenta, <laughs> yeah, polenta, 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 Polenta Express. Uh. Um, no, it looks good, Napalm. What, which flour did you... Which um, Did you use um, Grano Turco Turkish flour? There's, 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 always, there's always controversy about, you know, which polenta is the right, which flour is the right... Um, cool well, I used uh, I used a polenta that I ordered from an Italian deli in London uh, in Soho called Camisas, and it, it, the the label said it's from it's from Lombardy. I mean, it's got the got the name of the region on the on the bag. It was came in a very nice um, sort of cloth bag. Um, yeah, cooked mm. cooked well. It needed quite it's a lot of stirring. One extraordinary piece of trivia that I um, I learned the other day. Um, extraordinary and completely irrelevant and probably not worth mentioning that in so embedded is polenta in the culture in bergamo that when they deal cards so do, do people deal cards usually um clockwise is that is that i would say conventional so, yeah. Ever else yeah unless they're doing it well, unless they're doing bergamo, it anti-clockwise well apparently in Bergamo you do it the other way because that's the way you stir the polenta oh wow um, do you know that in the, the Ber- I, I've oh, been reading about, sorry, about Gino Bartley for a later episode this week and uh, do you know that in the 1940s there was a moral crusade against pasta in Italy and it was believed that it caused yeah. scepticism, sloth and pessimism at the wow. same time there was a lot it was believed that cigarettes were the 
the, the kind of fuel of great athletes. Cigarettes were promoted among sports people quite widely. Was the owner of Polenta R Us behind this anti pasta Palen- crusade? Palen- it was Polenta King. I've remembered the name of the restaurant now. <laughs> anyway, on with the on with the on with the bicycling. Uh, um, uh, we're going to hear from. Well, Rich, yeah, sorry, Daniel. As a non-fan, as a Polenta agnostic, I mean, it's okay. You'll be, you'll be glad to know that we're leaving Polenta country and we're going to Risotto country because as soon as you get to the west side of Milan, where well, Luca Guercilena is from, that's very much Risotto country. Well, as you say, Daniel, we're going to hear from Luca Guercilena, currently the manager at Trek Segafredo, but he's been around for quite a long time, uh, involved in, in in several different teams. You and he go back quite a long way. We'll hear about that in later on in the interview. I know Luca Guercilena as the calmest man in professional cycling, having sat behind him on a flight from Bilbao to Milan a couple of years ago when we hit an air pocket, fell about 100 metres, it felt. Um, there were screams, people were crying, mass panic broke out, and Guercilena was reading a, a book in front of me and did not flinch. Didn't flinch at all. Cool as a cucumber. Very calm, Rich, and I thought very appropriate for this episode and our Jura in general, because Wim Bergamo, we've mentioned the coronavirus epidemic and the effect, the um, the ruinous effect that it's had in that region, but... Um, Luca to me symbolizes to a certain certain extent the rebirth or the sort of green shoots in Italian cycling over the last um, five or ten years because uh, Luca's quite an anomaly he's quite unusual in the uh, Italian cycling landscape in the sense that he was not a professional cyclist um, he's someone who went to university and studied and has a sports science and physiology background and that always marked him out as someone um, quite different um, at a time particularly going back 20 years when he started his career when Italian teams dominated but they were populated by old pros former pros and uh, people who were very much part of the fabric and the furniture but having said that rich i didn't know too much about where luca had come from um how he'd made his way into professional cycling and that's um, how we started our conversation a couple of weeks ago well i grew up in milano city i moved here in casinetta a bit later when uh, when i was married then um uh, but okay i mean we're talking about 10 kilometer distance so not uh, not that far and uh, no I mean my story is, is quite simple I was grew up with my mom because uh, my father died when I was four year old and um, so I grew up with her and uh, we were just we two till I was uh, 10 years old when she get uh, uh, remarried and um, let's say I have a normal childhood nothing special i was a typical italian boy going going to school and to church and uh, i grew up like this then my let's say my stepfather was um, is in uh, a guy that loves sports so he pushed me always to do any kind of sports while my mom she was very protective <laughs> so it was pretty there were, were enough co- contrast uh, on what to do but okay let's say as, as all the parents say school is school first but uh, my dad always says sports second so i practice uh, various kind of sports from volley from basket and, and that's it and then when i was uh, 15 i went out for a ride and i with some friends uh, with a normal bike, with a city bike, and I enjoyed that much. And I knew that in the neighborhood there was a, a bike shop, and uh, they have um, the, the, the owner of the shop as a, as a cycling team for for uh, youth categories. So with my dad, we went there to ask if they were willing to to have me. And uh, and with the fact that I was living so close to the shop, then they they say yes because uh, it was a really small team, and um, and I started there as a rider, and uh, well, from from that point, my my cycling career was immediately giving me enough signal to let me understand that I was not a champion, you know. <laughs> so and, and uh, look, if we just um. If I just stop you there and we just go go back a little bit. Um, so yep. your your f- your birth father, um, I think, he, were yep. you three or four? Did you say when he died? He, uh, 
Yeah, three yep. or four when he died. Um, and was he a, a doctor or a nurse or a health worker? I... No, he, he, he was an ambulance driver. Okay. And he yeah. was uh, killed in an, in, a, in an accident while he was driving with the, with the ambulance and was the typical uh, story sometimes looks like a movie but unlike is the reality you know that that evening was not his uh, his shit but uh, a friend a friend of him uh, asked him to to for for a substitution and he went and uh, he was never back and uh, but that's life you know my mother teach me that uh, for how much hard it is uh, you have never to to look back but look forward and uh, live with a good memory of the people and uh, and keep going so uh, for for me you know my my birth father was a sort of a, a hero because everybody uh, when all his friends and so on they were all always talking about him like a hero because he died on the while working in a in a in an ambulance while helping people and so on so it's been uh, obviously this kind of image that i have but then clearly when you grow up you discover also that uh, you can be a hero in a many different way and for what uh, what's my 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 childhood and so on then you know i have a lot of uh, love and respect for my mother that grew me up she was 21 when she was a widow and she grew me up by herself and then even for my stepfather that is younger than my mom and uh, he just uh, came in our family and he really did everything by himself uh, to 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 grow grow me up he, and this is not that i say but all my friends say that he's doing even more than a, than a birth father so i think i was being very lucky at the end in my life and so then um, as you said you, you sort of started off um you know when you were about 15 um to to ride yourself but just growing up how aware were you of the giro d'italia and, and cycling i know you're a you're a football fan as well i think you're an um a milan fan yeah but. yes <laughs> yeah i mean living in milan sports is a part of life so for sure the uh, you need to, to to, to, to be clear if you are a fan of Milan AC or Inter Milan and I went for the first one because uh, when I was uh, you know 13 like this when you really start to, to, to be involved in, in sports uh, was the time of uh, the Milan AC of Van Basten Uli Dreikar the uh, Dutch trio and uh, so I went very often to the stadium to watch the matches and so on and uh, so, so you were a, sure you were a glory was, hunter you, that's what we, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, on a way, yes. And uh, that was really, really nice, a nice time. But um, yeah, I mean, in, in that was a nice time in Milano. I think that uh, when I was a teenager and even a bit later, Milano was um, a city that was uh, growing very fast. We are talking about the 80s, 90s, and uh, and I love a lot that that atmosphere to feel the the city moving, the city very active and uh, and, and kind of stuff, you know, and um, and, and and Italy, uh, Italy in general, Italy in general. I mean, in the the, the 80s and, and 90s, it was a, a period when sort of Italy was at its peak, I suppose, economically. Um, yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, that was the, the the peak. I think that yeah, we had we had uh, some seasons in which we really grow up fast and good and well. Then obviously we have a, a, a slowdown, and uh, in, in the last few years also after 2015 with the Expo, I think Milan was back to to growing up really, really fast. I consider Milan a really very nice city so far now, and. Um, so I think that that's helped also me a lot in the way to be a bit ambitious or uh, looking to the to the future, knowing uh, that you can chase your passion, you know, because, um, I mean, it means to be lucky to live in a city like Milan because it gives you the, all the tools uh, you can, uh, you need to, to, to chase your passion. And uh, as I said, you know, I was, I was uh, studying and then I, I race and despite knowing that I was not a big champion then I can chase my passion and uh, and focus myself more on studying and after a point in, uh, in sports science okay so this is the period of um, this is the Pantani years um, you know yep. Italian cycling is 
having a bit of a, a golden age, certainly as far as you know, if you're a teenager yeah, we, or yeah. Yeah, when 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 uh, when I was racing the the first two, let's say the to tell the truth, the, the first race ever I've seen to get um, involved, let's say, was uh, was the World Championship of uh, Fondriest in Rene because I remember the, the scenario of the final that was very crazy. And then uh, later on, I in Italy, there was the dualism between Bugno and Chiapucci. And despite I was living very close to, to Gianni, uh, then I was a fan of Chiapucci for well, many years. L- Luca, what That's decided... So I think I've, I've written about this and, and, and asked people about this before, but I can't, um, I can't remember exactly you know, mm-hmm. what the conclusion was. But w- w- as far as you were concerned, what made someone... It's a bit like Milan and Inter. You know, it's not necessarily yes. geographical. It's not, there's a bit of politics in there, but not always. There's a bit of religion in there. But as far as you were concerned, what made someone like Bugno rather than Capucci or the other way around? Oof. Uh, well, there's, there's everything. I think there's, the most was the attitude to race. I mean, Gianni was more classy style. And, uh, you know, it doesn't speak that much. He's more more calm person. While Chiapucci was a very reactive, passionate. And uh, he loves to attacks and, and so on. So uh, there was always a bit the distinction between, um, let's say, a, a classy style and an aggressive style. So when you are young, probably you are go- more going to the the aggressive style while the elder people they were more looking for the for the classic style of of Gianni it was more um, let's call it as the more the attitude of a sir you know yeah, yeah but when you when you when you are young you look more for the aggressive the passion just uh, go all in uh, without thinking that much so i think that was a, a bit the the reason why i was uh, i was uh, looking more for Chiapucci than, than Bugno at that time the cycling podcast at Our Giro d'Italia is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thanks very much indeed to Science in Sport, still powering me around Our Giro and uh, supporting you, the listeners, with the code SISCP25, which will get you 25% off all your Science in Sport goodies at scienceandsport.com. That's SISCP25. Once again, I recommend the Energy Bakes, and I think the strawberry are my favourite flavour. I've got strawberry, lemon and orange here, uh, and I've got fewest left of the strawberry, so that tells you that they're probably my favourite. Um, and they, they, they're they going to come in handy this week, um, Daniel, with a couple of extra long stages of our Giro. But anyway, uh, we heard before the break there from Luca Guarcelena talking about his, his background, I suppose. It was interesting to hear him talking about the Bugno Chiapucci years, um, you know, one of the great rivalries in Italian cycling, um, you know, of which there have been many over the years. I was quite surprised that he was a Chiapucci man because, um, as he said, Chiapucci was very emotional and, and impulsive and, and Bugno seemed to be far more calculating and cool-headed. And as I said earlier, that's how I... Uh, look at Guarcelena as quite a sort of cool customer rather than a an impetuous character like Chiapucci was. Yeah, and I, I was sort of prodding Rich, um, but I, I don't think there really is a, um, anything to this or um, Luca couldn't quite give me the answer that um, I was looking for about, um, you know, what what determined whether someone was one or the other, Chiapucci or Bugno. And it is similar with a lot of Italian football teams. You know, sometimes there is a very strong religious subtext or political subtext, um, but sometimes there is, there is not. Um, and I think the main, as Luca hinted at there, the main um, the main thing that determined whether you were Chiapucci or Bugno was, well, it was a, a kind of emotional thing, but there was also an age element to it as well, some demographic ev- um, element to it. Um, I think the younger fans tended to be more um, attracted to Chiapucci. But as, as we heard um, Lucas say there, Rich, he'd sort of given up on his dreams of becoming a professional cyclist quite early. He'd then gone on to, well, he started training as a coach and a physiologist and he worked for um, junior teams or he coached, um, took care of junior teams, under 23 teams. But um, he was about to get his, his big break and join the, the MAPE talent factory and um, encounter 
Aldo Sassi for the first time. Aldo Sassi um, later became famous as the coach of um, Cadell Evans, but he was also um, a very influential figure at MAPE. And, and he was also, as I mentioned about Luca at the start of the episode, he was an antidote to the sort of Michele Ferraris and the, these sort of notorious names that had been associated with great successes in Italian cycling, but also associated with some of the, sh- the, the kind of shadier headlines around Italian cycling at that time. Aldo Sassi was, um, by reputation, quite different and and, um, yeah, he found a bit of a kindred spirit in Luca. That's an interesting date, uh, Luca, September 98, because I was about to ask you, as a, as a young um, young guy who'd, who'd studied sports science and, you know, was passionate about cycling and was innocent and, I suppose, you know, maybe naive, um, did you have any doubts about going into close contact with professional cycling if we think about that time you know that's two months after the Festina scandal and um, as far as most people were concerned that was all professional cycling was it was just doping well I have to tell that uh, when I when I started to work with MAPE the the line of MAPE was a very very clear already so I feel very protected despite uh, whatever was going on in cycling you know because um, Aldo gave directly a line that uh, being a coach or being a physical trainer has a certain ethics and that was just to work on making people better and not affecting their health and stuff like this so for sure it was a was a hard time uh, we knew that the the medical side was uh, having uh, sort of uh, of dark uh, influence on the on the sport but uh, for what was concerning me i was very lucky because uh, Aldo protected uh, all of us and uh, gave us a clear uh, stamp as a just coach, nothing more than a coach. So we are talking about efforts and uh, repetition and endurance and stuff like this and not, not about uh, other kind of stuff. And um, and at that time, I was working for the most just with the, with the young guys, you know, so we took like... Um, uh, like a mandate to start to teach the young generation to say that cycling is is just pedaling on a bike and that's it and try to start to to make a uh, to make distance of what was the the problem of of cycling in that uh, in that era and i think that uh, it, it took a while but then we achieved it well it was four years from then until um Mappe until Dr. Squincy pulled out but did you and Aldo and everyone there and particularly the physiologists particularly the sports scientists um, feel more and more isolated over those four years in that in that line in those ethics in that philosophy because you know things didn't change in Italian cycling and if whatever problems Italian cycling had over the next 15 years you know some of their roots their origins were in the the failure to listen and heed the messages that were coming at that time. Yeah, I mean, uh, for sure, was we we felt that we were different. That for sure, but simply because uh, Mr. Squincy started to 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 give clear lines on uh, which were the range we which we would like to work. So. Uh, I, personally, I can't say isolated. I think that was more affecting probably the riders. So we knew, I mean, there was a couple of situations with Mapei riders were feeling really isolated. But so far, for what was concerning us at the, at the lab, especially we working with the young guys, we didn't feel isolated. And, and, and as I said, I think we were even more motivated because we 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 thought we were going in a, in a different direction, but that was the right direction. So uh, let's say it was... Uh, uh, more, con- we were more in contrast on what we, what was going to happen outside, you know, and uh, and as I said we knew that was a, a slow uh, mental set change, uh, and it would have took uh, years, but uh, the feeling was that we were in the right direction. So that's why we never felt really isolated because we have the big support from the from the owner of the of the team of. Uh, and of the lab, you know. So I think that uh, if we if we talk about isolation, probably isolation is not the right word. But we, what I felt was more when we after 2002 when I started to work with Quickstep, and I was identified really as a sport director coach, and that was the first time that coach means coach 
and I was probably one of the first one that was not an ex-pro, you know. So there was more a situation in which you constantly need to explain what you was doing in that uh, in that team, because before it was more the doctors taking care about uh, physical preparation and uh, and uh, and coaching, while the 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 figure of a guy that was just coaching and being sport director, so totally focused just on the pure performance, was something very new. And on that time, I feel more. I can't say he's isolated, but uh, I don't know exactly how he's in English, but uh, a white fly, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, a white fly. So that was was a uh, was uh, even more uh, that that feeling. And and that Mape Luca, you ended up um, taking care of the well, what was what they sort of called the young team, the the third division yeah. team, um, the the yes. young group um, at the time, which. Um, has become sort of, well, very fondly remembered, especially by the riders who were part of that group, the Bernard Eisels and Pippo Pozzato and Cancellara. They still, you know, talk about it as the best years of their career in a lot of cases. Um, and, and, you know, we know a lot of those names. They went on to have great careers. Um, Michael Rogers was another one. Um, yeah. But there were a lot of guys who didn't have great careers, um, the Pavel Zerzans and um, yep. Graziano Gaspare, people like that. Yeah. Um, if you yeah. look back now, if, if you know, I'd asked you in the first two or three months of that project um, who yeah. was going to succeed, who was going to be a world star and who was not going to succeed, how, how right would you have been in your predictions? Well, I can say that from the two, uh, from, from those groups, the two that for sure they have different qualities were Pozzato and Cancellara, um, because for the most they were, uh, you know, were the psychological attitude that they had was a way different. They were really focusing on uh, uh, enjoying their life at the time, but in the meanwhile you see that uh, they were uh, physically, they were champion, you know. So once their uh, their focus went uh, more on uh, from enjoying life to be a rider, I was almost sure that they they would have been great successful rider. Uh, then there was another uh, group of riders that was uh, very strong. I mean, when I speak about especially Michael, um, Michael was already in a in a in a structure of the Australian Institute of Sport was uh, well set up. So uh, it was difficult at that time to predict how uh, f- stronger it could have been because they have already be, big, uh, big assistance. But uh, so far, then he, he proved that he was a, also a, a great rider. For many others, I mean, you felt that they could have been a good, a good having good careers, but you see that we are not going uh, too far because of uh, some of them as good physical uh, data but psychologically we are pretty weak you know and uh, some of them you see was uh, was adapting too fast to help, help the other instead of uh, of uh, taking care about uh, themselves for uh, for focusing on on big results and um, but so far i think that the project was good because in 2002 we have 40 riders i think uh, each of them win at least one race, and then uh, we won 59 races in the season. And till March, uh, we were the first team in the whole uh, in the whole uh, cycling ranking. You know, till that Milan Sanremo gave too much point that we can match it. But uh, it was a great experience because we have uh, we have many victories and. Uh, uh, and it proved that if you make good selection, then you you are able to to create uh, uh, the base for the for the first division team. And I think that that was sort of a pilot study that then give uh, the actual cycling. And I think in two thousand and one, around about two thousand and one, you also tested a very promising British rider called uh, Daniel Daniel. Freeber, I think. I think. Yeah, can yeah, you, rem- yeah. I can remember, you remember? I remember. Yeah. <laughs> I remember. I remember testing you. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think. Sure. I think. Very, very promising, but I think that uh, <laughs> is broke. It's like, you, you're like my. The one my that career, got away. You know? 
Right. Yeah, you, you you identify immediately which were your limits, and finally you you get uh, on a direction linked to cycling, but not as. <laughs> but I think <laughs> it was a good choice. <laughs> I think you um you overlooked the fact, Luca. I was I was overtrained that day. I remember when I did the test, and I think my he uh, yeah. my um. My VO2 max was, I can't remember whether it was 68 or, or something like that. But, you know, it could have been could have been in the low 70s on a good day. I think you missed out. I think, um, you know, a future Grand Tour winner <laughs> slipped through your fingers yeah, there. Yeah. Some time gap and some time gap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, Luca, just to sum up the, the MAPE period, um, I mean, obviously, um, in the last few months, we've had the very sad news that Dr. Squinzy and his wife both died um, um, in, in quick succession um, just a couple of months ago. But, um, you know, when I talk about MAPE and I was only there, you know, I was working in the company for a few months. And, and whenever I talk about it, I talk about the sort of level of integration of the company and the, and the team and how proud yep. people who worked for the company were of the team. And, and you know, maybe because MAPE was a company that made a quite a product that wasn't very glamorous. Um, yeah. And, you know, if you go to a dinner party and say you work for an adhesive company, the conversation maybe maybe stops. But if you if everyone knows, you know, the, about the MAPE cycling team, then it's a completely different conversation. Um, but but what did you, I mean, what are the, the sort of the, the themes and, and things that you explain to people when when you say MAPE was kind of different and it was an unusual and it was unique? How do you explain that to people? Well, I, I think that uh, the in MAPE we were proud to be part of the company, you know, and that's what's coming exactly from Mr. Squincy and, and Mrs. Pazzoli because uh, the team was a, stretch, a strategy within the company. It was not just... Uh, you know, having fun, giving your brand name to a to a cycling team, and that's it. You know, we were feeling part of of a global picture in which, okay, we race, we give fun, we give emotion, we let know a brand, and uh, and at the, and at that time, the company got benefit. So you feel part of a mechanism that that uh, was giving. Uh, uh, was giving benefit to everybody in the company and uh, and you feel very proud of that and then you see the feeling that uh, mr Quincy has uh, with the people and uh, how much he, he let you feel part of of that project and i think is a is a quality that just big leaders have um, he was never having the feeling to be just someone but he was feeling really a part of of the group of the company, you know, and uh, and I think if I analyze it now, I think that all the people that had worked for uh, for Mape, they have the same feeling, and I think that that's was coming exactly because uh, Mr. Squincy was a great leader, and he has a, a great group of manager uh, picked up by him, and th- those manager were giving you uh, all the tools to to get. Um, Let's say to develop your passion in a in a job, and uh, having fun, but still giving you the possibility to to progress and deliver what was uh, really your hundred percent capacity. And I think that that's why Mape is still a, a great company, and uh, and uh, and still all the people that were linked to to that project, they're still feeling proud or proud of that. On a way, I think that Mape really changed cycling uh, because it was the first team probably really linked to a big company that use cycling to increase uh, his market uh, his market a lot using cycling really as a strategy to to build up uh, to build up the company so i think it was a, a really a, a, has to be considered a flagship for 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 cycling movement uh, ever i think and um, Dr. Squincy, well, he takes the decision to leave in 2002 and, and um, you go on to, to quick step. I mean, over the next few years, I just want to sort of sum up um, y- you as a coach and someone who, you know, uh, knew the amateur scene in Italy and knew Italian cycling very well at that point. I mean, I, I see those next few years as the years when, although Italians were still winning, kind of underneath that that was where Italian cycling started to go a bit wrong um you know at the amateur level and and you know all the problems that maybe we've seen in the last five or six years that their sort of roots were were in that decade really 
Um, would, would you agree with that? And, and if so, what exactly do you think was, was going wrong at that point? Well, I, I think that when, uh, well, well, in 2003, I moved to, to, to Quickstep at the time and uh, called by, by Lefebvre and Crespi that were setting up the team. Um, in Italy, that time uh, was very complicated on the amateur side simply because, uh, that's my belief, all the, let's call it the, the people that are working a bit in the dark pro cycling in the 90s, uh, then they, due to the restriction and the rules and the, and the new mental set that we start to, to, to born in the pro cycling, they moved down to the, to the amateur cycling. And that was the, that was the big problem, you know, uh, because then over there you find also, uh, let's pass me the terms, uh, a low cultural level. So it was easy for people promising you to win very easy to, to get, uh, to attract, uh, to attract, uh, uh, riders and, uh, and that's create, uh, create a big gap on what were the uh, ideal scenario of, uh, of a clean sport versus what was the, uh, the reality in the, in the, in the young teams. Uh, but I said, you know, it's, it's correct. There was the roots uh, started coming from very far and uh, it was a, a tough period because we, we need to change. Uh, but uh, I think that the, 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 the challenge was very deep, very, very hard, but at the end, I truly believe we succeeded. And I think that that was, was, uh, was worth the, the effort, you know. You can suffer because uh, maybe you change faster than others, but at the end, what is important that on long term, everything has a, had a big change. And that happened also in the amateur cycling. It took a while. Uh, sometimes you still now, you, 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 you find out someone that doesn't understand the uh, how it is, but I think that 99% uh, everything uh, got a big a big change. So that's the most important thing, I guess. And of course, parallel to that, I mean, cycling was becoming more global anyway. So the Italian influence was kind of diluted, but also Italy as a country was maybe hit harder than other places by global recession, wasn't it? Yes, yes, for sure. I mean, in the moment uh, we, we went global, uh, the the, the, the even in, if in Italy the cycling culture is very deep, uh, we were losing something. We were losing ground. I think all the others, uh, continent and country, get adapted fast to to what was cycling and uh, and find new resources, especially economical resources. And I think that then in uh, in two thousand eight, when there was the the big recession, then for sure uh, Italian cycling lose a. Uh, a bit of a ground, uh, especially in uh, keeping active the uh, Italian structures, you know, because I think that the, the Italian uh, movement is alive because there's many riders, many staff, the sport director school is one of the best and so on. Uh, but as well, I mean, one, you don't have any more the economical base to, to keep alive uh, structure that can be easily identified as Italians, then you miss something, you know because I always use this example to, to let understand people. I mean, when you are lost uh, or at least uh, you are sailing in a, in a sea and uh, you need a lighthouse to refer to, you know? So even if you have many, many ships uh, on, the, on, on sailing, but then you don't have a, you don't have a, a lighthouse to, to use as a reference, then it's very complicated that everybody Go in the in the right direction, and I think that's what uh, what happened with with Italian cycling at the end. We we slowly lost power, economical power. Then we lost uh, sport power, performance power, and at the end we are not able to set up anymore a, a big team that can be used as a reference for all the other, uh, let's say, pro team or continental team or amateur teams. And that's I think is pity for a for a country that has a cycling. Uh, uh, in his, in his culture, as said, that gave them ball to, to copy Bartali and, and so on. And, and, and as a coach, did you feel, especially when you went from Mappe to Quickstep and you were, while well, it was still a, a sort of half Italian environment, but, you know, there was another culture as well, a Belgian culture. Did you also feel that 
you'd come from a country that was at the forefront in terms of training, methodology, physiology, that you, that the Italians were, were slightly ahead? Yes, absolutely. I remember that uh, the difference between working with riders coming from Mapei versus riders coming from uh, from other teams, especially pure Belgians or, or let's say other countries in general, uh, there was a huge difference. I mean, with us, there was the, the physiology analysis, the testing capacity, the really like the, 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 the how to draft a, a training schedule was something really deep uh, in our uh, in our methodology, while uh, in 2003, I still remember there was plenty of riders that were just still going on on feelings, not even using heart rate monitors, something that in Italy was since years uh, a must. And uh, so there was a, was a big difference, you know, and, uh, and then you need, uh, if you are a good coach, you need, need always to adapt on, on the on the rider you have in front. So with someone we were uh, full deep in uh, in training schedule with someone other we are still uh, we were still uh, discussing about how to use a heart rate monitor and uh, and i think that uh, was nice it was challenging but i believe that we had uh, a very good team over there because there was the you know all the heritage coming from a pay team and in the meanwhile we were set up in a, in the country that has uh, cycling as a as a national sport and uh, I believe that Patrick and, uh, and Alvaro at the time they were able to really set up a very uh, a very nice group of people that uh, that can really focus on the, on the performance and on the victories because there uh, he, there was a, a clear line that focused on the one day race for the most but uh, the mentality was really to win each race in which we take uh, we take part and you you mentioned Lefebvre there, but the, the first time the well you you become sort of your name um, it, it becomes quite well known in the public is obviously the Leopard Trek years where you know the start of your process start of the process which led to you becoming a team manager. But you'd come from Quick Step. I mean, how much had you learned from Lefebvre? Because in the space of you know a year or two, you were effectively in Lefebvre's position um, in a big team. <laughs> Well, I learned a lot from Patrick because uh, first, uh, Patrick was the guy that gave me the opportunity to go with the junior team in Belgium when it was still, I think, 2000 or something like this to make the Flanders junior. So we selected young guys, went up there and Patrick was on my side uh, teaching me about uh, what it means to, to race on cobbles, on how to to tell the riders uh, what to do and how to and, and, and consequently how to train people for those kind of, of classic then later on when we worked together at Quickstep and he was the the leader of the team I think that uh, the, the main uh, the main uh, lessons I got from him was first always get surrounded by good people that believe in your project and this is something that now you find in the manual of leadership but I remember that at that time, he was already saying that the staff stay with you forever while the riders going in and out. You know, that's, that's uh, one of his mottos, isn't it? He, he says yes. that a lot. Yeah. Yes, correct, and uh, and it's true. I mean, if you if you read the books written by big leaders of big company, they're all saying the same. Um, then the another lesson that I always said with him is just to uh, find out riders that are. Uh, willing to uh, progress you know he said the big champion is always helpful but is uh, is a way better always to have uh, to have a, a young guy that uh, would like to to move up instead just focusing always on a on a big champion you know and i think that's uh, that's also a, a very good lesson and it's something that he he still going on doing and and uh, and it's unbelievable how they, they keep going scoring. And the third lesson is uh, uh, is always that um, you have never to step back, you know, uh, when you talk about uh, whatever, starting from sponsorship uh, to, to other kind of, of discussion, that uh, if you really believe in something, you need to keep chasing it and, uh, and, not, uh, and not step back, not get... Uh, 
destroyed by the, what, what is around, by radio tour voices or so on. Just focus on what you really need and try to, to, to get it. And um, that's why when I turned manager and, uh, at, uh, at the track, then uh, my first motto was uh, go and take it, you know, because it was something that uh, was coming from the heritage of, uh, of Patrick. And, um, and still, I believe him. I, I believe that he is one of my of the people that are uh, key in my life. You know, because if I would have not met Patrick, uh, even at my pay time, I can say as well as Aldo, uh, for sure, I was not. Uh, I was not in this position now. Another thing um, that has always been a, a bit of a feature of Quick Step, Luke, is how international it's been. I mean, okay, it's got a Belgian soul and, and it's had a bit of a well, half an Italian heart at, at times as well, but um, it has been very international. And, and if I think of your team throughout its um, you know fairly long history now, almost a, a decade, national and in the last 20 years or so, we've seen some teams that have really made that work. <laughs> Um, HTC were one that you know really made that work and we've seen others where the lack of sort of a, a clear identity whether it's a national identity or um, something else has been it seemed from the outside to be a bit of a hindrance I mean how much um, well, wh- where does that come from is that something that Trek want that it, it's as um, international as possible and how hard is that to deal with at, at times um well, for sure, the fact to be global and inter- an international team when we talk about the nationality represented is coming uh, from uh, the sponsor. I mean, even at the time that I learned at the time of MAPEI, in which, as I said, the team was a really a marketing tool to promote the brand. And I think that in this case, uh, what I learned at that time is very useful with, with Track, that is a similar company, so global with the uh, uh, you know, spots everywhere and uh, and is present in, uh, in so many continents and countries. So I think that that's for sure is coming from uh, from uh, from that. It's true that uh, uh, there's a pro and contra, uh, even being an international team, you know. The good thing is that you are not stuck in a typical uh, uh, country mentality or national mentality, because when you have 75, 80% of the people of the same country, then you can have some limit because everybody thinks the same and you don't feel anymore the, the sparkling atmosphere when, when you have to deal with different uh, mentalities. Uh, in the meanwhile, it's very good to be involved in a, in a global team because uh, you, you can deal with uh, different culture, different way to to see the the problems or find solutions and so on but it's true that sometimes as well you miss a uh, kind of attitude in certain race that you leave it uh, just if you are part of a country you know i mean uh, when there was liquid gas and there was giro d'italia and there were 85 percent were uh, were italians then you know that at the giro that team was going to kick ass you know whatever was happening, but that was their must. As well as when with Quickstep we went to the Belgian races and we need almost to do trials to to find out the eight riders at the start. You feel that was was different. Uh, being global is true that you're more attractive everywhere, but sometimes you miss that uh, that kind of uh, of specific attitude. That said, I believe that when you have great rider, great leaders uh, as riders, then everything. Uh, go back in his place because the everybody's motivated despite the nationality to to get the results and i think that that's uh, that's the big effort you we have always to do as, as team managers amar cord i remember no no non lo voglio vedere sono facilmente impressionabile <laughs> Ciao Ciro. Hai rischiato di rovinare tutto con una vittoria eh, non so, non so, so. No, ma no. tornando no, seri. Sì. No, dillo te, finché ci sono io. Ma in inglese? Sì. So dear listener, we are here in the bus with Filippo Pozzato. He tried to win today. He was not able to win, but for me it's the same. My love for you, for him. It's the same, even bigger. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we better leave before there are kisses exchanged. Grazie, people. Ciao. Oh. 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 Oh.
Well, that was a day I remember very fondly, Daniel, um, Chiro and Pipo Pozzato. Pozzato went so close to winning that stage, got away on his own and was caught by a sort of marauding bunch or at least one or two were off the front. Roger Kluger won the stage for I Am Cycling. The day after, they announced they were pulling out the sport altogether. Uh, but a, a great moment of, I don't know what we would call it, um, you know, the, a moment where the caricature of Pozzato that Chiro has carefully cultivated almost met the, was almost met the shattered. caricature of Chiro. It was almost shattered, wasn't it? <laughs> but a, a caricature which is really in stark contrast to the to the image that Luca painted there, because you know I I mentioned all the great there's a panoply of young stars um, that Mappe had at that time, and um, you know Luca's quite adamant there that Pozzato was was one of the most talented, if not the most talented alongside Fabian Cancellara and um, you know at at the time when he was at MAPE um, people predicted an, a, a glittering future for him I mean he went on to have a good career let's let's mm. not forget that he did win Milan San Remo and he came close um, he was on the podium in in other monuments as well so um, it wasn't all sort of clown shoes and you know um, no I mean it's wa- to his we've pistols, discussed before haven't we it's to his credit that, that he embraced that that caricature in the last few yeah. years of his career Ch- Chiro and I have been speaking a lot about Pozzato recently because um, I think as we've mentioned um, in the podcast recently, he's organising the Italian National Championships this year, which has been a bit of a movable feast because of the calendar changes. And I can't remember exactly when it's supposed to be now, but it's going to be in his home region. Of course, Chiro and I, we always used to um, refer to Pozzato and still do as Il Pavone di San Rigo, the, the peacock of San Rigo, which is from where he's from. And we've taken to calling the Italian National Championships that he's organising as La, La Grande Pavonata. <laughs> La, La Pavonata would be like the peacock party or the big peacock bake. I mean, meanwhile, the, the peacock of Coventry um, stands in stark contrast to Pozzato. Pozzato is somebody who, who um, you know, didn't take himself too seriously as an athlete. Um, as we heard in that clip there, Daniel, maybe you were somebody who took yourself a little bit too seriously as an athlete, or certainly, I'm not sure about that. certainly, certainly. There's always someone. Certainly. There's always someone who says, "Oh, I was a, I was a bit overtrained on yeah. the day I did the test. You were certainly oh, and my trying. shoes you were, were too tight, yeah. or I got the I brought the wrong arm warmers." You were, and trying, to circulation. You were trying to encourage oh. Guercialino there to, to say <laughs> that you were the one that got away, but I thought he very subtly, very gently, very politely. Um, refused confirmed that you had definitely made the, the correct I mean, career choice Luca's let a few um, top riders slip through his fingers a few minnows years, slip but, through um, his net but Bob Bob Youngles I mean I see a lot of myself in Bob Youngles <laughs> I mean he, he's another rider who sort of eluded um, Luca's grasp so you know he's got form unfortunately as much as I, I admire what he's done at Trek Segafredo um, Trek Segafredo incidentally Rich I should have mentioned this earlier that the the owner of the Segafredo um, company is currently marooned on his boat um, somewhere somewhere in the Polynesian islands um, and he's been there for three months Stuck. wow wow probably out of coffee by now is he <laughs> he might well be. He might well be. On the anyway, team, you were in the mi- anyway. You were yeah. in the middle of, of insulting me. <laughs> no, no, no. That was, that was fascinating to hear. Um, on the team, I mean, the, the team have I thought started the season extremely well. Yeah, Jasper Stoyven obviously won at Het Newsblad. Um, he looked very good. I thought Mads Pedersen looked extremely good. Like he was, you know, shaping up for for big bigger targets further down the road. Um, uh, Moschetti started with a couple of wins then broke his leg didn't he and had a horrific injury um, they've got Vincenzo Nibli now on the team haven't they? Um, they they started the season looking pretty lively I thought yeah they have I think it, it's a team that has had a very international character and, and this is something I've spoken to Luca about before that that brings advantages and disadvantages one of the advantages is that you don't necessarily get cliques in the same way that you do at other teams but but at times the team can can feel as though or teams like that can feel as though they lack a soul and they lack a, a strong identity and they lack a really sort of unifying um, galvanizing force when for example they are doing the big races um, you know for example the Giro in Italy they don't have a, a strong Italian core that sort of feels the race more cl- keenly than a, an international team same at the Belgian Classics I mean even their staff is incredibly international they're director sportifs they've got a Danish director sportif a Dutch 
director, sportif, um, French. Um, and, and I think that's posed a, a bit of a challenge for them. But, um, you know, they've certainly... Um, had some good riders over the last few years and Luca has still got a very good grasp of um, where the talent is coming from particularly in Italy he's got a very good network um, and, and he's a, a good talent spotter I think Deserve a mention too for the women's team Luca has sort of overall responsibility for that as well and was very involved in setting it up and they I think it's fair to say you know after one year sort of raised the bar a little bit in women's cycling um, in, in the way that they're doing things and in the way they present themselves at races and so on um, so that's been a, a positive addition um, we're going to hear from Luca Guercialena again but shall we hear from Chiro again first with the latest selection for his dream team Giro Dream Team with Chiro Scognamiglio Rider right, number four, dear listeners, Oscar Pereiro, for his victory at the Tour de France 2006 after Floyd Landis disqualification, for my visit and his home in Vigo, Spain, for the fact that his apartment was really near the sea, and for the fact that when my interview ended, I spent all day at the beach Thank, thanks Oscar to live near the sea and not on Paso San Pellegrino so only a couple of riders is it two or three riders left um, two or three spots to fill on Giro's on Chiro's dream team Giro dream team we've also got a team manager to come I think and a director sportif um, how are we thinking that it's, it's shaping up so far um, interesting mix of riders I mean we've had mm. Pereiro we've had pret a David Miller we've had Contador um, Nibali Cavendish Cavendish yeah Mark Cavendish Pozzato obviously is there Elia Radio Viviani yeah it's an interesting eclectic lineup, isn't it well, well, hasn't I- really got anyone to, to fetch bottles yet has he <laughs> Mark no. Cavendish can do that on, on his day or not on his day, off off his day. Well, Chaps, I didn't ask Luca Guercilena to, to name his Giro Dream Team, but I did think it would be interesting if we, we did a quick run-through of some of the, the sort of hits and misses of his managerial and, and coaching career so far, spanning his MAPA years to, to the present day at Trek Segafredo. Um, some obvious names and some slightly less obvious ones as well. Oh, from Paolo Bettini, I can say that he was training more than the people uh, thought because everybody says Bettini is not training a lot. He, lo- he loved to say that because then the, the other competitors uh, give him more chance, I guess. But I, I, I think Paolo was a was a was a, a great worker, and I think that his big power was really the mentality. I mean, uh, I the day he would like to to win the race, you start to feel it since the morning. It was amazing, and uh, we are f- close friend now. And uh, and I have to say that it was the rider that teach me the most than not me teaching him. Et Luca Paolini, si superbe qui renoue avec la victoire. Luca Paolini, enfin vainqueur. Oh, Luca Paolini was a uh, was and is a super funny guy. Uh, at that time, uh, he was a, a clear teammate, giving everything for everybody. But I believe he could have won a lot of more because he has the capacity to win a lot of more. I, I think he's a guy that loves a lot to stay in a good company and, uh, and enjoy people. And uh, he prefers uh, prefer to help the others instead of being him in the, in the, in the front page. C'è Petacchi con Bon nella ruota, Filippo Pozzato ancora qualche metro di andato. 10 metri ancora! Pozzato, Pozzato, Pozzato. a vincere! Pozzato su Petacchi! Wow, that's been um, <laughs> the, the, one of the huge talent I, I work with and uh, I think for sure he, he has also won not enough for his capacity uh, but uh, a lot is depending because he's a, a very sensitive person despite what people think 
and uh, often he was uh, too much involved in uh, in team situations in which he has not to and uh, instead to just focus into to race but um, I believe he was uh, he, he, is, he was one of the biggest talent I ever seen a six seconds arrivato Schleck quindi ne guadagna una trentina considerato la buono oh and the Schleck i can easily say that uh, um, uh, he was just touched by God and God told him you will be a bike rider. Because I think he, when you t- speak about pure talent, I think Antti is uh, uh, one of the biggest ever, ever. Because uh, he was... Uh, He was able to make performance even without training that much, just because the engine was so big that uh, that he can do everything. But as as many times happen, when you are a, you are a big talent, then you have not maybe the the full capacity to keep everything in your hands. And I think that that's what uh, what was uh, was Andy. You know, he was uh, so good. And everything comes so easy that then when he, if he has to face uh, difficulties, then was more in trouble than uh, than other cap- riders that has less capacities. I think he has. Paul has gone off and decided just to leave everybody else to play, including Vincenzo Nibali. This is Chris Horner reaching out for this crown. Uh, <laughs> Chris Horner, I, I think that we all agreed it was a great surprise to see him uh, winning the, the Vuelta. Um, Chris was a was and is a super funny guy, and uh, is uh, lovely to work with him. And in uh, in that world, uh, I think that we he was able to win it because for sure was a, a, a very strong rider, but especially because was underestimated from all the other Greek champion in in that race, especially in the first ten uh, days. They gave him too much advantage without considering that they were not too much time trial because it was an uphill time trial essentially and uh, and Chris was coming from a, a very strong year starting with the second place at Tirreno and uh, and was the guy that was fresher than all the other because was not at the Tour de France so uh, I can say he was very strong I can consider that we use a good strategy and we were we had a lot of luck at that time ganador, ganador, ganador. Julian Arredondo sí. oh, uh, Julian Redondo uh, is, is difficult to analyze because he always claim health problem after uh, his great season with us. Uh, at the moment, I thought he, he was lazy, but uh, he's a person that he, is very difficult to, to define. I think he could have been really a new Porito Rodriguez, but uh, probably... He came at the point after many years uh, struggling to have uh, to have a let's call it a good life uh, in which he gave up and then uh, he was not able to perform anymore and uh, and he has to quit and Bob Jungels has done it again another day in pink for him tomorrow no one was going to deny Bob Jungels his moment Bob I think he's uh, he's a very strong rider a talented rider and uh, I believe uh, he can be one of the reference for the one day race while I don't believe he will be a GC riders if not in a Grand Tour where there will be not uh, too many top hill uh, finish it should be a, a Grand Tour that has uh, many time trial and, uh, and not long 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 climb but uh, for one day race especially in the year 10 I truly believe that he can be a reference for many years. I think jerseys are plenty in this Giro d'Italia for Alberto Contador. He took it very, very early on at Abetone Stage 5. He's only had one night where it hasn't been on the chair next to him. A pure leader. A pure leader. I, I would have worked with Alberto 10 years because I never seen someone with such a leader capacity and able to pull out from uh, his teammates 150% at each race but delivering uh, everything for the team and, uh, and and for the teammates I I was very surprised to discover that and uh, really pity I could have not worked with Alberto longer 
En dan komt Weiland. Weiland, Weiland, Weiland door de midden. Of Brown in het Gaat midden. Brown hier voor de verrassing zorgen of is het Weiland? Weiland. Brown. Brown. Weiland. Weiland. Oh, that's a uh, yeah, that's a heartbreak uh, memory. And uh, was a was a lovely guy. I mean, we we moved to Leopard Track together in 2011 and uh, unlucky I had to sign the paper that he was passed uh, there on the road and uh, something I would have never th- think in my life to 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 do that. Uh, I said time is gentleman till to a point because those are memories that you can never forget and uh, and time by time is still uh, very emotional when you th- when I think about that moment and this poor guy he, is missed you know because he's uh, was a guy at the top of his age and uh, in in the ramp to be a, a very good rider and uh, that crash uh, brought him away and is really heartbreaking when i think about him and uh, was and still is a shock when i think about that day And that was the the, li- the life and times of uh, Luca Guercelena, um the boss at Trek Segafredo. And uh, well, I, I know you've known and him for Rich. a long time, Daniel. Yes, I have, Rich. And um, we should have said as well that this is a bit of a double header we've got coming up because it's 10 years since midway through the 2010 season, behind the scenes at what was then, you know, by some people's reckoning, the best team in the world, Saxo Bank. There was a bit of a mutiny. Um, taking shape and a lot of the best riders in that team so the Schleck brothers Cancellara and others were plotting to leave Bjarne Reese and and join a new team a Luxembourg based team which was going to be called Leopard Trek and one of the most influential figures or one of the main um, figures in the management there was going to be Luca Guercilena and, and really Trek Segafredo is, is sort of a, a continuation and an offshoot of that project um, Luca went to that team um, but the manager the the other figurehead of that team was a gentleman by the name of Brian Negard. Um, I, I I cleared this with Brian before the episode today. He doesn't mind if we pronounce his name wrong, so we're gonna we're gonna call him Brian Nygard um, for the purposes of tomorrow's podcast. But Brian is gonna be the the, the subject or the um, the main feature the main attraction of tomorrow's podcast which is our wine stage um we're going from um we, where are we going from we're going from magenta um there's a bit of a wine link magenta you know you can have magenta sort of colored sort of you know magenta robe of a wine no Mm-hmm. Mag- yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Sort of red, isn't it? Reddish, isn't ruby, it? Sort, sort of purplish of ruby. Yeah, yes. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it's we're on going that f- spectrum, isn't it? Um, we're going from Magenta to Barolo um, through the hills, the Lange Hills in Piedmont, and we're going to be talking a lot about wine. And Brian is someone who is passionate about wine, and um, who is no longer working in cycling. He's he's working in the wine industry today. But we're going to have a a nice catch up with Brian. Um, tomorrow hear about his time as a press officer as a journalist and now as a winemaker indeed well until tomorrow thank you very much Lionel thank you Richard thank you Daniel thank you chaps